This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contacts. Great. Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone. So, welcome to today's session of um, today's webinar session of Texas for Location uh, Independent Entrepreneurs. So, thank you so much for joining us um, today, although it's a public holiday here in Malaysia. So, thank you so much for joining us. It's a wonderful Thursday morning as well. So, my name is Wan Ning and I'm the Committee Manager for Work. And so, I'm just going to start by giving a little bit introduction to what is work. All right, so we are actually a hyper-localized um, business community where all our freelancers, entrepreneurs, and SMEs converge and collaborate under um, one roof. So we pride ourselves as a place where productivity is at its utmost by making it easy for all our members to enjoy a stress-free real estate and opportunities to leverage on the community to supercharge each and um, every co-worker in its space and across its networks. So we actually want to change the way people work together for the better. And our aim is to create the largest and most productive co-working community by taking care of all of you know, everyone's um, workplace needs and facilitating a deeper connection. So every inch of space that we design, you know, every community events that we curated has this in mind. So that's um, a brief introduction of um, what is work and Feel free to let me know if you guys would like to know more about work after the session. All right, I'm just, uh, you can just um, let me know in the chat box here. All right, so that's all about work and I would like to hand over today's session back to Darren. So Darren, over to you. All right. Yay. So thank you very much, work. I appreciate the privilege and honor of having an opportunity to speak to some of your members and I value quality over quantity. So I'm, I'm actually happier that it's a small group. So these are people who are really keen, really interested, really motivated and have a business that they care about and they want some answers. So what, I, what I intend to do, please bear with me. I'll walk through a, a short slide uh, deck. And I'm not going to be more than 20 minutes or so, which gives us ample opportunity for Q&A. I think the real value comes from the Q&A session. So with that, I'm just going to talk through six things you should know about taxes as a location independent entrepreneur like yourself. So let's hit the... Okay. So... I, my name is Darren Joseph. I run a, a small semi-autonomous team within Moore's role in Asia Pacific, a, a wider practice in Asia. So we have 30 offices across, I think, 12 countries now. So from as far north as Beijing and Tokyo, all the way down to Sydney. Oops, oh, the wrong button. I actually sit in Singapore. I've been based in Singapore for about seven years now. And we have an office, of course, in Malaysia. The, we have, the, there's a, an office in KL, of course, in Malacca, in JB, in Kuching. And I, I think that's it. So that's, that's the website if you want to reach out to, to our local partners or you can just contact us and we'll get through to them for you. Because I am licensed by the U.S. Department of Treasury, I'm legally required to say that nothing we say here today should be construed as advice. We're having a general conversation about general tax principles. If you're looking for what we would call actionable intelligence, you need to engage someone who knows your situation inside out. I may be a tax consultant, but I'm not your tax consultant. So that's what we necessarily need to say to stay out of jail. Now, what I hope would be the result or the takeaway from this is that you walk away not with answers. You're not going to become like the expert in international tax for people who work remotely or online sellers or, or whatever. But what I'm hoping that you walk away with is an appreciation of some of the key concerns that you need to have 
as you look for someone who can fit your situation and help you move forward. So again, I'm hoping to, to equip you with just some mental concepts that you need to keep in mind as you look for uh, a solution. So I want to talk about six things, you know, just keep it short and sweet. So six things that I, I believe are worth considering. The first of which is, is something called flag theory. I know there's some companies that are South Style and they use that name, but it's a concept. It's, it's not an, a company per se. It's an idea that was first popularized by this guy in the 1950s. And essentially what it speaks about is diversifying your lifestyle. I don't know how many of you are what we call digital nomads or location independent. So you do move around then this may be something for you to consider if you're just like 100% based in Malaysia. It's something to consider, but perhaps less important for you, for you guys. And again, we can take a deeper dive into this in the Q&A session if it is of interest to you. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is the idea of fake news. It's real. Fake news is real. I know that's a, sort of an oxymoron, but you know what I'm trying to say. The most dangerous thing you can do is look on some Facebook group and take legal advice from a Facebook group or a YouTuber. <laughs> it is bizarre that some people do that, but I must declare I have a conflict of interest. Most people who do what we do, we actually make more money cleaning up the mess caused by poor advice or lack of advice than we do helping people get things right the first time around. So in a way, it's in our interest that you make a mistake i know that sounds twisted but i'm actually telling you please don't take advice even if you think someone has a similar situation to you and that's why they're able to advise you in a facebook group you don't know what nuance they may have they may have a different residency citizenship a slightly different business model which means that what works for them may not necessarily work for you and i call out a few things that are misunderstood the idea of nexus or effective management, we will get into that on a separate, under a separate heading. That's so important. It needs its own treatment. There are programs that exist internationally, for example, Estonia e-residency. It's not, sometimes the, the way it's marketed is different from its actual function. So it's called e-residency, but trust me, it has nothing to do with residency. It's not an immigration program. It's simply a government, an e-government portal or e-government program. That's all it is. So sometimes the way it's pitched may not be what it actually is. I also call out that in some jurisdictions, if you are truly location independent and you move around, you would find that some jurisdictions are stricter than others. So the idea of landing in a jurisdiction, finding a co-working space and plugging in and starting to work. It may work in some jurisdictions, it may not work in others. So you need to be careful with that. And there's a whole debate, and that's, that's a whole segue into the idea of moving around so that you pay no tax. It is possible, but it has consequences that you should be aware of. Again, if this is of interest, we could get into it later on as well. So in terms of taxes, I think most people, you know, you have a business, you're pretty clued up on the idea of direct taxes. These are taxes that you pay to a given tax authority on the income or the profits that you derive from your business. So it's two-sided in that most of you would have a company, assuming that you're well advanced in your entrepreneurial journey. You have a company and that company pays profits on its taxes somewhere. And then separate and distinct from the company would be yourself. So you take a, a salary, a bonus, or you get dividends at the end of the year. You yourself also pay taxes as a person directly to the tax authority, let's say in Malaysia or wherever it is, you may trigger presence, a taxable presence. But what is less understood or what gets less attention is the idea of indirect taxes. And what do you mean by that? Especially when you work online with digital products or even physical products. Some of you guys that do drop shipping and uh, stuff like that. Uh, it's something that you need to be so aware of. It is not well understood. It is, it is, it is poorly explained online. And it's as a result, there's so many mistakes with it. 
And of course, as tax authorities all over the world are strapped for cash, they're paying more attention to indirect taxes than they previously did vis-a-vis -vis direct taxes. And what do I mean by indirect taxes? These are taxes you don't pay directly necessarily to the tax authority. You would pay it to the person. You, you First of all, you collect it from your customers. So you add it to your customers. So like in Malaysia, it might be a sales tax or a services tax. In Singapore, it'd be GST. In the EU, it'll be VAT. In the US, it'll be sales and use taxes. So you pay it to whoever you're buying stuff from as well. And it, it gets paid to the tax authority indirectly. So, so that's what I mean. So basically, these tend to be forms of sales taxes. You just need to be super, super, super aware and sensitive to it. I also said earlier that I want to take a slightly deeper dive into the idea of nexus, <laughs> starting with the place of effective management. What do I mean by that? Again, when you follow, unfortunately, fake news, they, they give you this impression that you form a company, let's say in Dubai, Caymans, BVI, Cook Islands, Vanuatu, Marshall Islands, Seychelles, you know, you pick your jurisdiction. And then suddenly you have a, you have a tax-free company. Mm, not exactly. The reason why is that the taxability of your company or the tax exposure of your company is also driven by where decisions are being made, where in this case is your place of effective management. So if it is you have a company, let's say in the BVI, or you may have an offshore Hong Kong company, which used to be kind of like really popular. So BVI Hong Kong is offshore. So therefore it's zero tax in Hong Kong, zero tax in the BVI. If you are based in Malaysia and you are a tax resident in Malaysia, either by virtue of citizen uh, resident EP or just being there beyond a certain number of days, then, and you are the key decision making your own company, which you tend to be since you're an entrepreneur, solo, a solopreneur, or you have C-suite in Malaysia, for example, that company can be taxed by the Malaysian tax authority. And you may think, well, hold on, no, why? Companies incorporated in Hong Kong or BVI, and uh, that's not how it works. By virtue of you being in Malaysia and running that company from Malaysia, the tax authority can take the view that it is a Malaysian company. And it, it, it works the same in the EU, same in Singapore next door. You run an offshore company from in Singapore, they will tax it as if it's a Singaporean company. So again, it's just something to be aware of, where decisions being made, where you see sweet, where your other directors, especially executive directors, where do they sit, which jurisdictions they sit, it can create a taxable presence. And stepping back from the place of effective management is the broader concept of nexus. What does that mean? Nexus means it's a general connection. So. It is a popular discussion point right now, for example, with the US. So there's some rules change around Nexus in, let's say, I think it was 2017, 2018, 2018. As a result, things that before, you know, it was about physical presence, you know, do you have boots on the ground in a given state? And that triggers Nexus. And that means that if, when you're selling online on Amazon, FBA, eBay, Walmart, through your own website, whatever, uh, Shopify, wh whatever you're using, only when you have physical presence would it trigger Nexus through the whole idea of place of effect and management, right? But now the definition of Nexus is so much broader. Right now, it means that you can have a warehouse. You can be selling to buyers in, let's say, uh, New York but the goods that you got on Alibaba or, uh, you know, AliExpress, you, it, uh, you, you're putting them onto Amazon and Amazon has a warehouse in North Carolina. And so it goes via North Carolina before it gets to your buyers in New York. Well, hold on. By virtue of having that warehouse, even though it's a third party warehouse and it's not directly run by you, that creates a taxable presence in North Carolina and you may have to pay sales and use taxes there. In fact, you may have to pay income taxes there depending on how it goes. And even in New York, so, and then of course, when it goes to New York, well, yeah, once you get, once you have more than a certain threshold in terms of sales, you'll be subject to sales and use tax there too. 
and it, it's even more sensitive. There's click-through nexus for those who have uh, affiliate links, affiliate marketing uh, partners in different states that could create nexus as well. So the idea of nexus, uh, and especially as it connects with indirect taxes and to some extent direct taxes, something to consider. Uh, in the EU as well, once this is above a certain threshold, you need to register for VAT. So, uh, yeah, Nexus. It's, it's not just about physical presence anymore. Once you have a level of economic activity, you need to be thinking about taxes in those jurisdictions. And that leads me to digital taxation in general. It is, a, it is the most uh, dynamic area right now of international tax. Why? Because all governments are, you know, of course, they're strapped for cash. They're looking to pick up every penny. And they recognize that things are going online, to state the perfectly obvious. Things are going online. So they need to raise their game when it comes to taxing stuff online, whether it's a digital good, something that's downloadable some sort of app or, or whatever game or whatever the case may be, whether it's a physical good that you're buying from one jurisdiction and then uh, through arbitrage selling into another, or if you're just providing a service, you're just your consultant, your graphic designer, whatever it is, you're doing that activity online, governments are trying to figure out a way to tax it. And I know I've seen online that there are you know, the, these grids and the, these tables trying to tell you how taxes work. These are so deceptive because it's so complex. Oops, I did something funny there. It's so complex that it's impossible for any one table to really capture how complex it is. So, for example, in the U.S., yes, you have 50 states, but you have ten, over 10,000 sales and use tax jurisdictions because each state is further divided into sales and use tax jurisdiction. And of course, in the EU, you have multiple jurisdictions. Or in France, you have a digital tax, plus you have the VAT. And the thresholds are obviously different. So my advice really is, and this gets me to the last part, you need a team. You are an entrepreneur, you are a business owner, you are a leader, and what are you trying to do? And your time is best spent running your business, not trying to figure out the intricacies of tax. And the last thing you want to do is ignore it because it comes back to bite you. And when it comes back to bite you later on because you didn't pay attention, the bite is going to be much worse than if you dealt with it up front. So maybe it's too early in your journey to have like a board of directors, but definitely some sort of advisory committee or a network of people that you know that you can call upon should you have certain questions. So. With that, yep, about 20 minutes, I will hit the pause button and open the floor to Q&A. Any questions? Any question? <clears throat> Not all at once. Yeah, if, if you have any question, please. Um, unmute yourself and then just speak up, or you can write it down down in the chat room. Okay, dokie. Meanwhile, if you are shy here, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you in the chat room. Please do not hesitate to contact us at help at atj.tax or contact us at LinkedIn, which I put down below the 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 link for my and then for Darren LinkedIn. And then kindly follow us in your favorite podcast platform. The link is down below. And then on YouTube also. Down below. Thank you. <laughs> no questions? I guess everyone is shy. Or maybe everyone got their questions answered. Miracles do happen. <laughs> Okay. Okay then, if there is no question, if you share no question, then I will give it back to work. Are you there? 
Hi. Hi. All right. So there's no questions from the floor. Are you guys? I bet you guys are very much, you know, uh, understood this whole session. <laughs> you guys really, you know, have the full takeaway from today's session. <laughs> mm, all right. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Sorry. Ah, yes. Um, yeah. Could you hear me? Yes. So yes. I was in a call, so I was lost to vote to, um, to ask questions, but I would like to ask a question, but I'm not uh, really sure is that question suitable to ask here. Um, I'm doing some like uh, e-commerce job shipping um, uh, online, and then I would like to know if I like uh, sell to uh, US or like uh, through Amazon, like uh, Darren just said. Uh, should I need to pay, uh, pay the test? And if I need to pay the test, how could I pay the test? Is it Amazon will help me or I need to set up a company in where I sell my product to? Uh, yes, how to pay the test, I would like to know. Or am I need to pay the test? That's, that's a great question. So in terms of how you pay, yes and no about Amazon. Yes, they can provide you a report, but the report just shows where their warehouses are. So that's a start right so where they they give you a report i think either they email it to you or you go into your portal as a seller and you can download it you can ask if, if you're unsure where it is so that's where you that's where the conversation begins so definitely those places those warehouses that your products touch you should be looking to register how do you register will you approach the tax authority in that given jurisdiction and you say hey I've been selling through Amazon and I'd like to register. Some of them, most of them have like a part of their website, the, the state website itself where you, can, where you can register on your own. So, so that's one way, but remember the definition of nexus has been expanded to economic activity, not just physical presence, which means that the report that you get from Amazon is insufficient. So then you have to go through your own sales and pick up where in which jurisdictions you you you've had sales and whether it passes a threshold now when you look online they're going to say well the threshold is 200 units or a hundred thousand mm, dollars no that's that's an average but there are jurisdictions in the u.s because remember there are ten thousand of them with a lower threshold and there are some of the higher thresholds so you need to check them out individually there is software so if you google uh, I, I'm, I'm not promoting anybody's software, but if you Google, you can find software that claims to be able to do it. No software is perfect, as you can imagine, especially since it, inter it needs to interface with a government department that is not fully automated. So some jurisdictions it works. In the U.S., some jurisdictions it does not work. And you still need to manually intervene. So what, what people do, and unfortunately, it's not cheap, the software is kind of, it, the software is not cheap. It's kind of like medium expensive, but you probably, depending on the complexity of your sales, how much you've been selling and how many jurisdictions, you may have to hire a consultant like us and there are many others, I'm not saying us, you can Google and you decide for yourself who you want to work with, but you probably need to uh, engage a consultant if the software isn't sufficient for you. Now, as for the other question you asked, perhaps in passing, about whether you need to form a company, that's, that's where you probably need to take advice. Under many circumstances, uh, a company may be tax, more tax efficient than selling on your own. But putting tax to one side, there's also the idea of product liability, right? So if, for example, you know, you're selling I don't know, vitamins or something, chewing gum, something like that. And something happens or a toy and a kid is playing with a toy and the kid gets hurt. Mm -mm. Then you get sued. And if you, if you don't have a company, if you didn't sell that product to a company, they come after you personally. Whereas when you have a company, the veil of incorporation protects you from the unlimited liability of somebody suing you. So it's something perhaps to consider as you as you meet with your consultant. Mm, understood. But then if I like, I find my company in my local hometown and I sell online to worldwide, 
then I should mm. uh is it I think it's not a must to set up a company worldwide, right? And if uh, talking of, uh, speaking of uh, liabilities, uh, I'm not sure how how this how, how is uh, liability handles if I shoot worldwide. How this uh, can it suit me or or like is it, or like is it already okay if I found my company in my local hometown and then I I I I, I ship worldwide. I mean, so does it make any sense if I found company in many places outside my home time, right? Right. So that, again, that's a, another good question. So it really depends on your business model, and unfortunately, one size doesn't fit all. Your first port of call, and you're correct, is your local a local business advisor, a local accountant, or lawyer to advise you on your liability. In let's say you're in Malaysia, in Malaysia. Now, I don't know what, but that this is a question to ask because remember this, the, I gave you six points to take away. And number six is the most important, which is you need a team. You can't do this alone. So the question becomes that advisor that you found locally can advise you on Malaysia, but who's gonna advise you internationally? Perhaps he or she can, perhaps they cannot. If they cannot, then you need to find someone who can advise you internationally. As to what you do in each country, no, you may not have to register a new company in each jurisdiction in which you sell, but sometimes you may, depending on, on your business model. So sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it does not. So you need to get advice that applies to all the jurisdictions in which you're exposed, okay, not just well, local. Okay, thanks, Darren. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I see uh, a question in the... Yes, I will read it for you. Okay. The question is from Di Han Chen. You say, if I work for Malaysia, let's say sole proprietor, and sell physical goods digitally to Singapore via sales platform, but receive no commission from Singapore buyer, directly but receive commission from Philippines factory this the Singapore buyer firm has to set withholding tax with that transaction with regards to my commission part um would the situation be different if I physically present visit the Singapore buyer firm to sell the above said physical goods instead of selling them digitally Sam receive commission from Philippines factory directly Okay, that's that's a quite a complex situation. So, of course, this is not a, a legally binding answer. We're just talking about the principles that you need to consider as you seek an advisor to give you a proper conclusion on this. But you starting in Malaysia, the first question to ask yourself and ask your advisor is: Should you be selling on your own, or should you set up a Cinderian Berhad? Should you set up a Malaysian company to do it? Uh, maybe. You should set up a company. Maybe it should be a sole prop. It, that's, that's a question to ask whether it's more tax efficient and not just tax efficient, but also a product liability issue. So, you know, God forbid, I, I'm not saying anything bad is going to happen, but sometimes bad things do happen. If anything happens in Singapore and that buyer in Singapore has an issue, and of course they go to the Singapore government as they do for everything, and that government department comes after you, who would they find? you personally or a company it's again something to consider so there's the liability issue plus the tax issue moving on uh you're selling physical goods digitally to singapore so no sales platform and you receive no commission from singapore buyer so physical goods are arriving at a port in singapore chances are it needs in order to enter singapore it may need to register for vat uh, sorry, they call it GST, same thing, but GST in Singapore. Again, that's where you take advice from someone in Singapore as to whether this is subject to GST on entering Singapore. Uh, and again, it depends on the nature of the contract uh, that you make as the seller or whoever the seller is, whether it's you or the Philippines, whoever is engaging in the contract, the seller to the buyer. If you are selling it, and title passes at the port. So uh, sometimes it's, you know, again, technical, whether it's free on board or whatever. Is it B2B, is it B2C? 
stuff like that. So depending on the, the format of that contract, you may need to register for GST. That's just something to think about. Now, in terms of you getting payment or whoever is getting payment from Singapore, is it going to be subject to withholding? Mm, for physical product, typically no. Typically no. I'm not saying no, but I'm saying typically no. So again, it depends on a lot of factors, but typically this shouldn't be a withholding tax. Typically, there may be GST, but there shouldn't be a withholding tax, typically. And there may be customs duties, but there shouldn't be a withholding tax on that money coming out from, from Singapore, unless, okay, I won't get into that. That makes it more complex. So it shouldn't be a withholding tax. Now, you're saying that it's, you receive no payment from Singapore, but you get a commission from the Philippines. Uh, okay. When that commission comes from the Philippines factory, I don't know how they're going to do it, but Philippines, uh, from as a, a tax authority in the Philippines, the, the, the BIR, I think it is, they're way more strict than IRAS, the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore. BIR is more strict because their tax rules are more strict. So you didn't ask, but I'm telling you that you should have a conversation with the guys in the Philippines because they may be withholding on the money coming out to the Philippines. They're really, really strict on, on withholding of like everything coming out of the Philippines. So it's something to consider. All right. Uh, now you ask then, would, it, would the situation change if you were physically present in Singapore and set physical goods instead of selling them digitally? Uh, yes because then the decisions are being made from Singapore. So then if, IRA, of course the question becomes, well, how is IRAS gonna figure it out? I don't know, but if they do, then the answer is yes. You may be subject to some sort of income tax if you're doing it personally as a sole prop, or if you'd set up a Cinder and Burhad, if you had a Malaysian company and you had boots on the ground in Singapore, then that company may be subject to corporate tax in Singapore. So to summarize, you have three jurisdictions in play. You have obviously Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines. So you need to speak to most, I think most established uh, accounting practices or tax practices in KL understand Singapore because there's just so much commerce going in between uh, Singapore and Malaysia. So that should be easy to find. The tricky bit would be finding someone who can speak to the Philippines. Because if it is you're gonna be hit by withholding coming out to the Philippines, maybe that means you need to renegotiate the terms that you have with the Filipino supplier. So you need to sit with an advisor who understands all three jurisdictions and plan it out properly, not just from a tax perspective, but also from a product liability perspective, knowing that Singapore is really strict. As you know, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. Singapore is super strict. So you just wanna make sure that you're protected as you're personally protected. You don't want any issues and you know, you just follow all the rules. Any other question? <clears throat> Not a question. Then go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one more question from Dihan. Yeah. Yes, then. Okay. Uh, so, for example, SDN BHD sole proprietor can pay for income tax for physical goods sold in Singapore to IRS. So, again, if, if there's no boots on the ground in Singapore, typically Singapore won't levy an income tax on the product. What they will do, what they may do is look, of course, uh, duties. Uh, you know, any import duties, but more importantly, GST, which is the Singapore equivalent of the sales tax or the services tax that you have in Malaysia. The question is the registration for that. 
And in order to do that, you need to consult uh, a Singapore tax practitioner to get a decisive action, uh, answer on that. So again, if you have no uh, real nexus in Singapore, especially in terms of physical presence, you should not have to worry about income taxes. You worry about the indirect taxes, which they call GST, which is what Malaysia calls sales tax or services tax. If it is you do pass a certain threshold, which I think is a million sing, then you do have to worry about digital tax. Singapore is a digital tax, just like Malaysia is a digital tax. I think they both came in at the same time last year. And I think Malaysia is, is triggered at a, a relatively high threshold, like 750,000 ringgit. Singapore is like a million sing. So if it is that the, if it is a digital good and it's at that threshold, you worry about that. But for now, it's really a conversation about GST and sales and services tax. That's a conversation with Singapore. Okay. All right. So I hope um, Darren has answered your question, um, Dehan. Any more questions before we wrap up for today's session? Mm. All good. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay. All good. Thank you so much for today's session, Darren. It was a fruitful session, I believe. So those of you um, who, um, I mean, like, who didn't ask any questions, I hope that you guys got the maximum takeaway from today's session. All right. Or if you have any further questions, um, further, I mean, like, after today's session, feel free to reach out to um Darren and the team on the LinkedIn. They have actually sent out um their you know uh, how to reach out to them. All right. You can tag them at um help Elias HTJ or you reach out to them on LinkedIn as well. All right, so any further questions before we really end the session? Okay. Yeah, there's a question yeah. about, <laughs> he's asking <laughs> about physical goods coming from outside of ASEAN. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it, the same principles would apply, except rather than the, the consultant that you're using having to understand the three jurisdictions, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore. The the fourth one will be wherever it comes from. They'll need to understand that as well and bring that into your planning. So, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Cool. So yes, thank you everyone um for joining today again. So um we shall keep in touch. All right. So feel free to follow um Darren on uh, on his LinkedIn and for work do reach out to us uh follow us on our Facebook and Instagram at Coworking Space as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, today. Yeah. I hope Bye -bye. you guys have a great day. Bye. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.txt. Email us at help at htj.txt to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.